Well, because this is the day that God made, that makes it a good day. Amen. Whatever God has done is good. So this is a good day because the Lord has made it. Tonight, I hope you've been uh, keeping up in our studies in the Latter Rain Issue series. I want to talk to you tonight again about that. Been speaking a lot about this recently, even filling in some of the other places because uh, filling in for some of the other teachings because I have a lot to stay here and I want to keep it as close to and relative to what uh, has been taking place in some of our own circles before we get too far beyond that. Uh, we've been looking at the question of the manifested sons and their teaching on the greater works ministry. And I told you uh, some while ago that I had this divided up into four different classifications. That's just to make it uh, more reasonable and understandable to you in your own mind in order to remember some of these things. We looked at the manifested sons leaders in the very beginning, like Britton and Warnock. Then we took a look at Hobart Freeman's uh, Greater Works Ministry teaching and how he taught that the overcomers would return during the tribulation in glorified bodies to minister to the denominational church. And tonight we're going to start the third division of the Manifested Sons, and those are the uh, prophetic people, the new prophetic movement. And it's going to take a long time now to look at this whole section. Here I have reference to people like uh, Paul Kane, Bob Jones, Mike Bickle, John Wimber, Rick Joyner, John Paul Jackson, and that whole group of people that has really just burst upon the charismatic scene uh, in a new public way in the last year or two. Charisma magazine and other magazines have picked up on this and have reported this, and you'll be hearing some of those statistics in some of these teachings. But we're talking about the new prophetic movement. Now, what's forced us to take a look at the prophetic movement, uh, look at these men and their beliefs, is their newfound acceptance in some of the faith camps out in the Midwest. I don't know, but that we wouldn't even be talking about this or them. I'm sure we wouldn't have. Had they not found this new acceptance in some of the faith camps out in the Midwest, I don't think we'd even be talking about it. But because they have, and that brings up the, the responsibility not to believe every spirit, as John tells us, but to try the spirits to see whether or not they are of God, First John 4, 1 and following, to see whether or not these people are right, this movement's right, and the teachings and teachers of this movement are right. And I guess it's the business of Paul Cain, I mean, to be real blunt with you, that really brought it all up. It was Paul Cain himself being invited into a certain church last December, December of 1989, that really brought all of this up. So we're going to have to uh, say a lot about uh, Paul Cain and his friends. Before getting into a documentation of their views on the Greater Works Ministry and the Rapture and the Tribulation and all of this, what I first want to provide, which will take all of tonight and maybe then some, I want to provide some of the background on this issue as it relates to the faith camps. So I've entitled our study tonight, How the Prophetic Wave Washed Away the Faith Camp. You know, whenever you are a, a new um, movement uh, in Christendom, you don't ever think that you're going to last too long. You think that, um, you know, it's new and the Lord will be back in within a short period of time. Before you know it, 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years have gone along and somebody's looking back documenting like you would any other movement, even as Luke did to the early Christian movement in the book of Acts, documenting some of the history of that Christian movement. And we have been uh, associated with, we've been a part of a certain faith circle, a certain faith circle and a faith camp that had origins out in the Midwest and uh, has outreaches in various places and people have been influenced by that in an even larger number of places. And those people are the ones who have been most deeply affected of late by this prophetic movement and the inroads that it's made. And so while it's still fresh in our memory, before too much has been said or done, this has only been going on less than a, well, a, a little over a year, I guess. While it's still fresh in our memory, I want to have down, as I see it and as I interpret and 
how the events have unfolded themselves, just how this whole business got going with their interaction with us. I want to have that recorded uh, on tape because, you know, you get several years down the road and some of that kind of becomes fuzzy. Well, who first said and how did they ever? And while it's still kind of fresh, I, I would like to um, get this documented. So what I want to give you is some of the background on this issue as it relates to the faith camps. I think that if you look back uh, on recent history in our circles discerningly, you'll see that the devil has set people up for a fall. And so I want to outline that in three different ways tonight. Again, I could just talk. I know a lot about it, have studied it, and been close to it for over a year now, and I could just talk about it. But maybe it'd be easier for you to take notes if I say let's divide it up into three different areas. Uh, first of all, the fact that the faith camp had been promised a greater works ministry for years. So you're already set up for certain other types of people who perhaps believe the same thing and yet believe other unscriptural things in addition to that who might come across your path later. So first of all, the faith camp has been promised the greater works ministry for years. Secondly, Satan took one of the only stabilizing factors in this movement by taking a pastor of a certain church in Indiana here a few years ago, taking his life and death. He was about one of the only stabilizing factors, even though he taught the Greater Works Ministry, at least he would never have gone for all the things people have gone for since his death. And so then thirdly, what happened after that, once you've lost, once you've already been set up for the Greater Works Ministry, and anything that's like that, or anybody who teaches that, a stabilizing factor your founding leader has taken from you, then you can kind of see what the conclusion is. People immediately began grasping and reaching and searching and looking for something new to follow. So let's study them in that order. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 14, uh, a statement is made over here. <clears throat> this is just before the cross, John 14. Jesus talking to the 11 in the upper room. We have verse 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world, now he means Satan, cometh and hath nothing in me and hath nothing in me. It's an interesting statement there that Satan hath nothing in me. And what he means by that is there's no, there's no doorway, there's no foothold, there's nothing by which the devil can gain entrance into Jesus. He's without sin, obviously. Now, if a movement or a person or a church has already been set up, well, we'd interpret it that way maybe in retrospect, but they've already been promised a certain false theory such as a greater works ministry, I'd say Satan has something in you. It's a seed of deception sown that you never realize in the first place that it's been sown and you never realize how that can grow into a horribly deformed tree just when certain other things fall into line, such as, as the second point we'll get to, that stabilizing factor, that being your leader, is taken away from you. And when you don't have that someone who, although he taught that, pretty much steered clear of anything else that was wild or non-biblical, unscriptural, once that's gone, then, then people are restless, they're immature, they're dissatisfied, they don't know the Word of God very well, they're emotional, they're Arminian, and they start reaching and grabbing for things. Once the devil already has a seed sown there, he's got something in you then. And so I would say that Satan had a place in the faith camp in Indiana. He had a place because of the false teaching on the greater works ministry. See, what would happen then, he would then be able, and this is exactly how it's worked out. No one prophesied this in the future. Uh, hindsight's very good, is it not? You can look back and see how these things have unfolded. But Satan would then, because he had this in their midst, be able to bring outside ministries across their path later on. And the Greater Works Ministry would provide a, enough of a common point of identification so that it would cause people to say, well, these other points where they're not quite on, we'll relax our requirements right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you've got something that serves as enough of a common point of identification or agreement, na na namely the Greater Works Ministry. That whenever you come across other ministers, as we'll tell you how they've done, they were isolated, and then they've said some tapes came across the desk of Pastor Brother so and so, and we heard him, and we thought, oh, pray, we didn't know anybody else in the world believed this, believe what this Greater Works Ministry thing. End Time Army, Joel's Army, Gideon's Army. 
And they were so amazed, so surprised, so shocked, so blessed, so encouraged that somebody else believed the same things. Now they've got a common point of identification. A seed has been sown, John 14, 30, Satan had something in them that then whenever they find out that, well, maybe there are some other things these prophets believe that we don't agree with, well, we'll relax the requirements right now. Before you know it, people just relax themselves and they begin to compromise the truth. So there's the first point in the background. The way I can look back and see this is that, and let's, not, let's give the devil enough credit for being able to kind of know how to deceive people. You put the Greater Works Ministry business in there, then all he's got to do is work on the second step, and that is take away whatever that stabilizing factor is. Take away that stabilizing factor. That's going to shake this whole movement, shake this whole group, perhaps open them up to hear some other things from other people that are going to be, well, way off base. Greater Works Ministry is already off base. doesn't have a foundation in God's Word, not the way they teach it. And then you're opened up for all types of other delusions to come your way, which has happened. The Logos Rhema and seven spirits of God and ecumenism and let's love the Roman Catholics and join up with the Vineyard Movement and all types of things now have come in. But I still will say, and I believe it's the truth, that never would have been allowed had uh, this stabilizing factor remained. Uh, which brings me to the second point then, and that is the death of Dr. Hobart Freeman. Now, he did teach the Greater Works Ministry. That was a problem, one, among others, in the faith camp that he was identified with, because that's not biblical. You teach that, and you don't eventually give it up or something happened, then you're, you're in for a fall. But although he did teach that, l listen to this, uh, he steadfastly resisted yoking up with some outside ministry. He steadfastly resisted yoking up with any outside ministry right down to the last day of his life. Because he felt they were all in some form of error. Now on earlier tapes, you'll hear references to other positive ones to other ministries that are not uh, careful statements. But then as you come into more life and you're more careful the way you refer to other ministers and ministries, you don't speak so approvingly of them. So there's a big difference, you see. You just contrast or compare the stabilizing factor that was there with the current ministers who have done anything but resist yoking up with other ministries. They are rushing to do that. They have been for a long time now. Why? What's wrong? The factor, the stabilizing factor, Dr. Freeman, who was there first, did not yoke up with other people. He didn't have anybody in his pulpit except somebody that he agreed with, that, that taught the same thing he believed. Can you imagine him having someone in there that taught a little bit of JDS and Logos Raymond and Seven Spirits of God, and then he'd say, well, we've got to give this guy time to grow. I mean, if anything, Dr. Freeman would be extreme in the other regard, to the other direction. But whenever he died, and he had steadfastly resisted yoking up with outside ministry and ministries because he felt they were all in some form of error, Whenever he died, that practice of his was not followed by those under him. No, on the contrary, look what happened whenever he died. There was a private tape done that I have a copy of entitled, Are You Heeding What the Spirit is Saying to the Church? Are you heeding? This was done before Dr. Freeman's death. Are you heeding what the Spirit is saying to the church? Now, on this tape, Dr. Freeman, uh, which I won't really give you my opinion of that tape and that message, but I'll just say this, that on that tape, he refers to all the various responsibilities he has, uh, including, and he's wanting to make sure that especially that the ministers in that church are taking heed to the message. They're not just there to um, be a part of the work so they can get a ministry, think they've got a calling, and think they've got a ministry and get out and be able to do something, which is exactly what happened. Again, in retrospect, we can see that. On that tape, he speaks of 50 to 60 ministers that are under him there in faith assembly. Now, where are all those ministers today? What he was trying to exhort and encourage them is, listen, just because you're a so-called minister out of this body doesn't guarantee you anything. Why are you here? Are you taking heed? Do you believe this? Are you really putting it into practice? Are you really committed? Well, now we can answer those questions, and we can answer them for most of those 50 to 60 men, ministers. Why, they had pastors quit. They had a pastor thrown out. 
Then they decided, well, we just won't have a pastor. Our first one died, our second one quit, and our last one we kicked out. So we just won't have a pastor. And they went that way for several years. And people just began to leave by the droves. Those that were left were unstable. I'm sorry to have to say this. This is my discernment. If somebody else wants to do a tape in some other state and say, well, he's wrong and here's my view, then go right ahead. They were unstable. They were, and I'm sorry to have to say it. People, you don't have to stay unstable. That's right. I, I, I don't wish that on someone. But if that's the fact, that's just the fact. They were unstable, immature, restless, dissatisfied. One man, one of the ministers, one of the 50 to 60 still left. Yeah, I mean, see, a lot of those friends are out selling uh, water softeners now. Or they're pastor of a brethren church or something. And some are dead. And some are uh, drinking and on drugs again. I mean, some of those ministers. I know about that. 50 to 60, I don't know where they all are. You count them on one hand probably that are left, and the ones you can count on one hand, what are they doing but following the prophetic movement? This is a terrible testimony. John 14, 30, the devil had something there. But one, one of the ministers has repeatedly confessed to being tired of sitting in a cornfield with our heads and notebooks filled up with theology, but we're not doing, quote-unquote, anything. And someone had told that man for many years stories about Abraham and stories about Paul that you have to be something before you can do something. And, and the highest calling is to be something, and sometimes that's all you ever get to do in life is just be. I told you in the last message on the uh, woman issue, the most important primary reason why we're getting the word is so that we can get the word, not so that we can help somebody else. That is secondary, and if and when that happens, praise God for it. But God wants us to be washed clean by the water of the word. He wants us to be washed clean. It's a privilege to get to know the word so we can be doers of the word. And then also it could be an added benefit if you get to be a teacher of the word or a helper of others with the word. But you know, as, as we've seen, you can help others and fail yourself. And that just needs to be told to us every now and then. Where are these 50 to 60 ministers? They were out ministering faith, flying in airplanes to their meetings, preaching a strong word of faith, going out for pizza afterwards, and then, oh, praise God, I got a ministry going. They're not in the ministry anymore today. They helped a lot of people, but they're not in the ministry anymore. That water has to, that word of the, the water of the word has to wash us clean. Our, our greatest commitment has to be to the fact that I'm in this so that I can learn about God and learn to be pleasing to him in my own life. And then if God wants to open up a ministry for me, that's, he'll be the first to tell me about it then. He'll be the first to open it up for me. I won't have to do a thing about it. So it gives me a problem whenever someone repeatedly saying, I'm tired. You know, it's supposed to come across like, um, you know, with a real helpful attitude. Well, we can't just be so selfish sitting here in a cornfield all these years. I don't know that I would call that selfish or not. You just do what God's called you to do. Stay there and learn the word. And if he wants to bring the world, the entire community into your church, he'll bring them in then. And as you go, preach saying, but you don't need to worry about trying to convert the mayor or the town or the state or anything. Just leave that stuff alone and take care of your own life. So it's meant to sound in a real selfless way. Oh, we can't stay here anymore. Tired of sitting in a cornfield. Tired of just having my head and my notebooks filled with notes on theology and biblical languages and Old Testament and New Testament. We've got to get out and do something. Boy, do people get an itch to do something. And it generally gets them into a lot of trouble. Amen. Whenever this big conference was had, I'll give you another reference to how the stabilizing factor was just sad. It was some type of stabilizing factor for a lot of people. It only proves whenever the stabilizing factor is taken away and the people don't last that there's something more basic that's wrong there. People should last if you've got the word. But from the conference last December, the two ministers who had that ministry up and were having Paul Cain in sent out a private letter just to ministers who are part of the faith camp which I was 
uh, sent a copy of, I received a copy of, which I'm not going to read in detail, just the front page, the second paragraph, they're ex describing Paul King's life and ministry and, you know, inviting us to participate and support and be a part, and this is going to be a big thing, and the last of this paragraph we read, we believe the supernatural nature of this encounter uh, with this man is a confirmation that the Lord is in this work. Our sole purpose is to fulfill the will of God and to restore, now, I noted that word right away, a new hope and zeal in all of the bodies that have been a part of this end time faith movement started by God through Brother Freeman and restore a new hope and zeal in all the bodies. Well, that just implies that everybody had lost it then. And how God's going to restore that is he's going to use this new prophet, Paul Cain, and bring it all back into place. Restore a new hope and a zeal. I, I have to wonder, friends, were people not just following a man? Were people not just following a man? And then I have to wonder, is that not what we're going to find again now, that people are following another man? Why is it that when one leader is taken, then you go down into so low that you have to have your hope and zeal restored again? And if it's restored by an encounter with another important, significant figure, public figure, what's going to happen whenever he's taken away from you? Or when he proves to be false? Or when his doctrines don't pan out with God's word? Then what's going to happen? I don't know, but that people are going to be grasping for another new movement. So we've got the fact that they're set up because of the Greater Works Ministry, and secondly, the stabilizing factor was taken, and thirdly, here's what happened. Immediately, people began looking for something new to follow. That's just, that's just the way that it is. I don't think, well, I know people would try to contradict that, but no one can really contradict that from the facts. People began grasping for new sideshows. If I can give it to you in chronological order, it went something like this. First of all, they wanted to grab a well-known charismatic figure in, and his right-hand man in New York City. And he brought us the repentance and brokenness mes message. Oh, we've got to be broken for our pride and broken for our sins and repent before God. And, you know, there can be a lot of truth to that, but you can misunderstand that or misconstrue that and actually uh, not only overcome your pride, but then uh, throw out the exclusive beliefs based on God's word that you had at one time in this uh, so-called um, selfless approach to other people. Well, I've got to greet my brother and sister in Christ, as one of the ministers would always say about anyone he meets, well, I can discern Christ in him. I can discern Christ in him. So after they went through the brokenness and repentance message, then they got the deliverance message. They rode that horse for a while. And then once it got a lame leg, they ran for Nigerian evangelism. You know, African-style evangelism. <laughs> well, we got a little taste of that, of a shouting, screaming, denominationally affiliated African evangelist. And he just doesn't know God's word. He started saying things that were wrong about the atonement, that Jesus didn't finish the uh, work on the cross. He had to go to hell and beat the devil up down there in hell. He didn't say Jesus died spiritually, and I never said that he did, although people lied about me behind my back saying that I said that he said that Jesus died spiritually. Uh, people evidently think that's the only error or heresy there is in the world. People have heard a couple of errors or heresies. Shepherdship, JDS, Logos Rhema, inner healing. When you said that, you said it all. There are all types of errors and heresies. And when you say, I don't care whether you say Jesus died spiritually or didn't die. I mean, if, if you say that he did die, you're, uh, you're a heretic for sure. If you say he didn't die, but he didn't finish the work on the cross, you're still a heretic. Just a different form of heresy. But you get, have Jesus down in hell beating the devil up down there. Well, anyway, they rode the African evangelism horse for a while whenever he got a lame leg then finally the prophet showed up just in time for them to jump on their back so they went through repentance deliverance evangelism from africa that's just you know evangelists go get everybody and start up halfway houses and coffee houses and we'll sing and bring the heathen in and pray for them and bring a big harvest in one of the houses names something like that and finally just about the time that was running out of steam the prophets came along so they hitched a ride piggyback on them. 
And so here's what's happened then in the past year or so. While some poured over past revivals and they began to pump the people all up for seeing something big. You know, we're going to have prayer meetings, cryings out to God for revival like they had back in the first great awakening and the second great awakening and uh, the Finney movement and the Moody movement and the Welsh revival and, and the Azusa Street revival. Got to get together for these prayer meetings and crying out to God for revival. They began pumping people up and, and try to force, I guess, the so-called Greater Works Ministry into being. While they were doing that, and I'll tell you what happened, the devil accommodated them and brought the prophets across their paths, and they fell for it. See, before the, before the devil ever brought the prophets across their path, they were already pouring over old revivals, trying to find out what should we be doing differently now. They figured, we've got enough Bible knowledge. We have enough of that now. We've got to go out and do something with this knowledge that we have. So let's pray all night and intercede. and got to have a revival here. It's going to sweep the world and sweep the nation here for Christ's sake. And bring this greater works ministry into being. If it's not going to be during the tribulation, let's just bring it in before the rapture then. And the devil brought the prophets across their paths at exactly the same time, and they took that as a sign from God. You know, things aren't just coincidences, but just because circumstances seem to arrange themselves in a certain way doesn't mean that you can say, well, God's behind this. Amen. The devil can also be behind that, attempting to set a person up for a fall. It was really sad to watch. It seemed like one church in Indiana was trying to find the right man. The right man, you know, once you lost your leader, you're looking for the right man. First of all, they looked in New York City, and then they looked in Nigeria. And while they were trying to find the right man, another group south of them in Indiana was looking for the right man here in the United States. And I mean by that the prophets. And I think the southern church won. They found the right man. It's interesting that the leader of the church north of the southern one even admitted on a tape, and I have all these references, that he was at first very cautious whenever he heard that this other group was having in Paul Cain. It's so funny to see one group is looking for the right man that's going to bring this together somehow. And the church at the, in the north was looking in Nigeria and even came back and reported, we found a man who's got the exact same end-time message as Hobart Freeman had. And it was a pastor, a bishop, a superintendent of 400 churches, and I don't know what all else, over in Africa. And, he's got this, and God gave it to him supernaturally. And while they're trying to find the right man to follow, the, the group to the south, they're not going to Africa because God showed the second leader down there, no, I'm going to bring a man who's fully empowered of God across your path. Whenever you meet him, you're going to be changed into another man. So you're not to go with them. You're to find that man here. And while one group is trying to find the guy in Africa, the other group is trying to find him in the United States, and it's like a race. Who's going to find him? And the southern church won. And the northern church even said, the leader on the tape, that he was very cautious at first. After all, they, they won the race. They found the right man down there. But, you know, once he kind of, well, I found out that he's okay, now the northern church started having Paul Cain in their group ministering. He's been at their church and ministered now. Southern church won. <laughs> oh, my. How all this came about, I'll, I'll tell you in more detail later, but the people down in the southern church first heard a tape, and then they were led by visions and words, and finally by just flopping the Bible open, and it fell to Matthew 10. And they just saw a verse there. That if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. And I mean, over, over matters like that, just an arrangement of circumstances. They're already looking for prophets and apostles. And then a couple of tapes, testimony tapes of a certain man happened to come across this pastor's desk. And then it just so happens they can arrange your schedule to get to be in a meeting where this man is. And it just so happens that he calls them out for a special word. All these circumstances arrange themselves in the right way. And they took all those as signs from heaven. And it all got capped off by opening up the Bible in Matthew 10. And there it says that, that if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet. So this is a prophet, let's receive it. They took all that as from God. And as I think some of you are aware, boggle the mind. One stunt was this, that somewhere back in the 1400s, I believe it was, Hobart Freeman ministered with Paul Kane in Columbus, Ohio. The stunts just boggle a person's mind. When, if you want to be honest before a jury or in a court of law about that whole matter, Dr. Freeman had lots of people he associated with early in his ministry, but let's don't talk about that because he grew into some more light. When you get to the end of his ministry, he's not associating with anybody like that. 
I could easily justify JDS by saying Dr. Freeman used to be friends with Kenneth Hagin. Dr. Freeman got his faith message from Kenneth Hagin. Look at all of Kenneth Hagin's books, who was on the scene decades before Dr. Freeman was, and you'll find on the back the theme passage of his ministry, Mark 11, 22 to 24. So I can easily say, well, see, Dr. Freeman must agree with JDS then, because he ministered with Hagin on several occasions. I mean, that's a stunt that just boggles your mind. It shows you how low, pe friends, people are stooping and how dishonest they are to say, well, we know that one time in Columbus, Ohio, back in the early 1400s, Dr. Freeman ministered with Paul Cain. As though that proves anything about Paul Cain now. Or another stunt on tape 289, I believe it is, in Dr. Freeman's tape list, on tape 289, he gives a testimony of a certain brother, and now that we've heard Paul Cain and heard him give that little humorous story about colitis, now we, that we've heard that, we know who Dr. Freeman was talking about, so he gave a positive reference to Paul Cain on tape 289. Tape 289 was done in 1974. That's a long time ago. And anyway, just because you give a positive reference about someone because of a testimony or healing they saw in their ministry wouldn't necessarily mean that you agree with all they stood for. Although maybe he did in 1974, but 1984, the year of his death, is another matter entirely. Man, there are enough rotten eggs in this story that get any detective searching. I talked to a state detective today. Detectives, they smell something, they start looking. And why, why are we Christians? I don't smell anything. Why is it all this just tumbling upon us? Well, we're looking, we're searching, but everybody else, what? What, what? I don't see anything. It's like they have no sight, no hearing, no smell, no touch anymore. They're out of touch with spiritual, biblical reality. Finally, it all came down to a big, hyped-up conference in Indianapolis in December of 1989. Now, that city in that time slot normally belonged to another meeting. <laughs> and how all that got changed uh, doesn't make for uh, very edifying material. From what I was told by a leader in Indiana who was a part of the normal meeting in December, every December in Indianapolis, as well as another leader in Kentucky. I think the time slot and the very motel, the Christmas holiday period, so-called, and the particular motel, particular city, Indianapolis, I think it was all unceremoniously preempted. And so under, under this point, I'd like to give you three things. This, this probably sounds like a strange message to take notes from. It's just kind of a rehearsal of the history of how this, as I see it, how it all came about. But talking about this conference in particular now, this, it, this is what it all finally came down to, was a big, hyped-up conference of the century going to propel us into the decade of the 90s, one man was always saying, implying this is probably the final decade. And many people have implied this is the final decade, final five years, final year, final month. We're going to prophesy the day of his return, and nobody has succeeded yet. All attempts to predict the second advent show a very poor track record. As a matter of fact, it's 100% failure so far. But three things notably stand out to me about this. First of all, there was what I just have to call bullheaded arrogance by one certain minister claiming the most high this and the most high that. The most high this, the most high that. The most high has shown, you know, most high is Daniel's phrase for God. The most high has shown us to have this man and no man's going to turn me back and the most high this and the most high that. What I would just call bullheaded arrogance. This minister I'm talking about had already been teaching much on the restoration of the prophetic, as he would call it, and the restoration of the apostolic, as he would call it. So the people are already set up whenever you meet a prophet. They're already set up. A tape was done by this minister entitled The Great Escape, The Great Escape, 
And let me read you a quotation from that. I just trust that you'll get the messages. This was done in his own home church in the Indianapolis area. I just trust that you'll get the messages that we did down at Zion Lake because some of you desperately need to hear the message, vision, voice, and verse, and you really need to hear what the burden of the pastor is on the need for apostolic ministry because that is my burden. If you want to know where this church is headed, then listen to this message because that's where we're headed and no man is going to turn me back from it. See, he had already made up his mind we are going to have prophets and apostles restored. We're going to have them, and I'm going to go out there and find one. That's just all there is to it. No man is going to turn me back. And whenever you're so uncautious like that, so unguarded, and you've already just said, I'm going to meet an apostle or prophet if it's the last thing I do. It's like the man who said, I'm going to work a miracle if it's the last thing I do. I'm going to meet a prophet or an apostle if it's the last thing I do. That's the direction this church is headed in. No man is going to turn me back. Just bull-headed arrogance. My God has shown me where we are to go, and we're moving in that direction. And you need to hear what brother so-and-so had to say, too, on we being the habitation of God and God being our habitation. Uh, some people, they still don't see what God is doing. God's new thing, he said, is a fulfillment of the old, not some new doctrine or path. It's the old path. We're going to see the apostolic ministry come on the scene. We're not compromising one thing, but we're going on. You have to read some of the material or hear some of it. One thing that has been very interesting to hear is a tape entitled Our Introduction to Paul Kane, where you hear all of these bull-headed, arrogant statements made. Now, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And sometimes it's cloaked with a little humility, like, well, we don't appear to, we don't mean to appear to put ourselves up front or uh, on the line as the only ones, but they do put themselves up front as the ones who are leading the faith camp into this new way and this new walk. Secondly, something else that has come out of that conference or surrounded the whole conference was this type of mentality that if you miss this conference, which is going to be a mighty move of the Spirit and it will thrust us into the decade of the 90s, if you miss this conference, you will miss God. Now, that has come across in so many different ways. They said that the conference is significant, so significant because it ushers us into the 90s, the greatest decade that we've yet seen where we're going to see the fulfillment of all that the prophets of old have said. Speaking of this tape, our introduction to Paul Cain, I don't know whether all of you realize this, but a tape was sent out by them. They wanted everyone that was coming to the conference, and even those that didn't, although they really wanted everyone there. They just felt it was that monumental and significant to hear this man that none of us had ever heard before, Paul Cain. But they wanted to send that tape out, our introduction to Paul Cain, for everyone to hear. It was one long 90-minute tape, but... What some of you might not realize and what a lot of people out there in our circles might not realize is that that was um, a very edited down form of the actual message that was delivered jointly by the pastor and his right-hand man. I got the original that has all the things that were deleted on the tape that everybody else, all the normal people heard. The ministers are ones who could get the other tape and hear everything that was said. And certain things are deleted. Now, I don't have a problem with deletions. I do that sometimes. I might make a real personal state, statement, maybe even mention a name, and may not want that to be on a tape. But some of the things that were deleted were very interesting to me. And I, I have played both of the tapes side by side going at the same time, and you can catch exactly what's been deleted from the normal tape that went out to everyone. So I want to read just a couple of those things, share a couple of the things that were deleted off of the tape that went out to everyone else. And I'm talking about this business, um, mighty conference here, and if you miss this conference, which after all, we are the ones holding it. It's not the church in the north, it's the church down here in Indianapolis holding this. If you miss this, you miss God. Now they didn't actually say that, but they came dangerously close to saying that. 
And if you'll just remember your own impression about a year ago of that whole business, that was what came along. This is so significant that if you miss it, you're going to miss God. You might not even kind of feel that way now, but you probably, if you remember your impression of a year ago, you'll remember that's the type of feeling that came across from what was being said down there. Well, I trust some of you remember that. Okay, here is, here is what was said, and I'll tell you when I'm reading the deleted part or the part omitted. Brother, his right-hand man, brother such and such and myself knew we were moving in the will of the Lord. Here starts the deletion. That no one else in our camps were saying it for the most part that the Lord Jesus was using us end of deletion that he was telling us to go forward and lead the people forward by faith and he said you go and i'll bring them now let me go back to the deletion what's important or significant about this is this little prideful statement here that no one else in our camps were saying it for the most part in other words we were the ones leading it they took that off now why would you take that statement off the tape except it doesn't sound very good there's nothing too personal on that or it doesn't give too much revelation, except it gives a lot of insight into what's in your own heart and your own mind. And then here's another thing. Uh, at this point, this pastor is comparing Cain to uh, William Branham, saying that Branham had actually sent Cain to one of the Scandinavian countries to minister in his stead. And... You know, our circles have often spoke very well and very highly of William Branham. Uh, he actually comes from that state, from uh, Indiana, the southernmost part of the state. And if you've heard that tape or remember some of the things said, then this was the story told that whenever Cain and Branham would get together, then they would each speak to each other by the word of the Lord, as this man would always run that phrase together, by the word of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, um, Branham would say to Cain, now... Uh, here's how it is with you, brother. And he would tell him right what's on his heart, you know. You know, our prophet, a seer, would reveal the very thoughts. And then Cain would turn around and say, and Brother Branham, here's what's on your heart. In other words, two prophets getting together and, you know, predicting each other, reading each other. It's like, I don't know, mind reading or something. Reads his heart, right, mind, and he reads his mind. So, you know, that's supposed to, because we already accept Branham, quote, unquote, our circles have, then, of course, see, you're hooked now. If you accept Branham, you've got to accept Cain. It's this domino effect, or it's this... Um, Spider's web effect. Everybody's tied everybody else in. He mentions, this pastor on the tape, he mentions that Branham had some air in his teachings. And then here's a quote. As far as being the Lord's prophet, most of us accept him. Here's the big deletion now. And yet this frightens some of you. I'm picking that up in my spirit and by the look on some of your faces. Because you're talking, you've heard. You actually have a fear of deception. You're afraid you're going to be deceived. Now, he said that on this our introduction to Paul Cain preparing the people for this seminar they were going to have, this conference in Indianapolis. Evidently, there were some people discerning or halfway discerning out there who were saying, wait just a minute now. What do you mean just bringing somebody in that we don't even know anything about and just accepting him just totally now? And that whole thing was deleted off of the tape. I'll read it again. Yet this frightens some of you. I'm picking that up in my spirit and by the look on some of your faces because you're talking. I think what he means there is you've been talking among yourself. Well, now, what do you think about this Cain guy? What have you heard about him? You've heard. See, he doesn't finish any of these sentences right here. You've heard. In other words, you've heard from some other people that maybe Cain, blah, 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 isn't so good after all before they even met the man. You actually have a fear of deception. You're afraid you're going to be deceived. Well, at this point, if you've got your Bible still open, how about Luke chapter 21? Let me just preach for a moment or two on Luke 21. This whole concept, friends, of trying to, um, oh, I don't know, it's dangerous because it hasn't worked in the past, and at the same time, all of us want to believe that Jesus is returning very soon uh, preferably in our lifetime, uh, preferably in the next year or two, that he, all of us want to believe that. So what becomes a very um, tight rope that you have to walk? You want to believe that. The Bible encourages us to look forward to the Lord's return. It's a, it's a blessed hope that we're looking to. 
You don't want to be pessimistic and say, as they said in 2 Peter 3, well, where is the promise of his coming? You want to look forward to the Lord returning soon, but here's the danger of any type of date setting. First of all, we say, oh, we'd never do date setting. Well, maybe not like the Jehovah's Witnesses have done and missed it before, or everybody else seems. There was a guy down in an astrophysicist retired or something in Arkansas last year, a year before, that predicted the date of the second advent. And, you know, I just couldn't believe it. He was going to write a book. He had calculated because of his uh, ability in physics and mathematics, the date of the second advent. And you just think, nobody's going to buy that book. Please tell me no one's going to buy it. It sold thousands of copies, thousands of copies. People are so gullible. And all that guy has to do, which he did, which everybody, including the Jehovah's Witnesses, have done is just say, well... I missed it that time because I forgot to take this into consideration. But I'll write another book next year. We'll get it right this time. And you know what? Thousands of people will buy the book. So our people in our circle say, well, we don't set any dates. Well, you know what? We haven't set a date, but we've come very close to that by saying what, what has been said right here. This conference, if you miss it, you miss God because it's going to propel us into the decade of the 90s, and that's the final decade. It's going to wrap all things up. Who told you that? Where does it say that in Scripture? I'd like to believe that. I'm kind of hoping and assuming, quote unquote, that that's true, but I don't have any way to prove that, and I can't really base my life on that because I don't have any proof of that. What would you do if you knew the decade of the 90s? Well, God just doesn't tell us this is the last decade. Well, they're continuing.